Lawrence is a full professor of artificial intelligence at Sorbonne University, and she heads the research team on affective and social dimensions in spoken interactions with robots, focusing on technological and uh, ethical issues. Um, Lawrence is more or less uh, 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 deeply associated with, uh, uh, with ethics in, uh, in AI. And today she will be talking to us about the elephant in the room, uh, ethical issues of generative AI. Laurence, you have the floor. Thank you very much for your invitation today. I'm sorry for not being with you. So I will explain uh, this keynote about ethical issues of generative AI. So um, I am also involved um, in uh, CNPEN, which is the French National Ethical Committee on Numerical Aspects, and AFNOR, where um, I um, lead a group uh, about a working group, sorry, about foundational and societal aspect of AI for trying to build some norms uh, on AI. So this working group is a uh, uh, direct by AFNOR, but is a, in a GTC 21 Sentinel-EC uh, uh, initiative, which is a European one to try to have some normalization um, aspect take into account. Um, waiting for the law, uh, it's very meaningful to um, take time to uh, be involved in these uh, <clears throat> activities. Why I say that? Because we are in a community of research, and uh, this is more for industrials, but because it's uh, uh, the elephant in the room, as you say, um, this new um, foundational models uh, pose a lot of uh, question, technical question, but also um, ethical question, and I am sure that um, the scientific, the science, uh, the researchers, a lot to say to 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 say about that, and uh, could be very helpful for um, innovative aspect in industry. Thanks. So, generative AI systems can produce multiple outputs from multimodal, multilingual inputs. So, generation of text, image, for translation, production of computer score, chatbots, and so on. And um, these um, pre-trained models on large data sets can be optimized to produce a new application using little additional data specific to that task. This is a very powerful aspect of these models. And the social and economic impacts of generative AI system um, is likely to be major in many potential use, for example, in healthcare, in education. I just put an example for um, uh, on Alpha Fold from DeepMind, which is about prediction of 3D protein structure from the sequence of animal acids. But there's a lot of application, like you know, text generation, translation, image generation, coding, and so on. ChatGPT um, was, um, which is a virtual assistant that uses this new technology uh, to converse in natural language on any subject, um, is a bomb in the community because uh, uh, not a lot of people was uh, able to explain how this system is uh, running, uh, what kind of uh, um, technologies are inside, and it was deployed largely, massively, in uh, all our countries. So ChatGPT is refined on the basis of a specific uh, model, which is GPT, Generative pre Model, and uh, uh, with um, three different uh, machine learning techniques, which are supervised uh, or unsupervised. So the goal um, to, to use this machine normally will be to um, augment our human intelligence. And therefore, um, there is a lot of uh, problems like uh, um, the fact that people are, which are not expert think that the, the, this kind of system will replace, replace human in a um, decision-making process or a lot of tasks. So the key element is to design uh, um, this interface that fluently enhances human intelligence with components of artificial generative intelligence. And the key point is to discuss also law, norms, and ethical issues. Um, I just put um, a brief uh, 
except of um, a paper from Bloomberg, date from yesterday, um, explaining that European plans stricter rules for most powerful generative AI model, which had the idea of regulation um, that could play um, uh, could be described in three categories, from very capable AI to uh, um, other kind of uh, system, which is not um, very simple to decide. And um, the fact that generative AI software can respond to Sibyl prompts with text pictures and video based on these large language models, often with an uh, eerie level of scale, is a very huge question. So Europe uh, still faces a number of key issues, technical issues, but also ethical issues, and how to approach the technology, including how exactly it would regulate generative AI and whether to completely ban live facial scanning in crowds. So these plans um, from the European Parliament and Council drew criticism that the government could hinder smaller companies' ability to compete with major tech giants. So it's a complex problem for law, for ethical issues and for normalization. Back to our purpose about uh, ethical issues. So the National Pilot Committee for Digital Ethics, CNPEM, was set up in late 2019 by the French Prime Minister on the recommendation of the report for a meaningful artificial intelligence by Cédric Villani. Um, it comes under the auspice of the National Consultative Ethics Committee, very known for Earth and Life Science, the CCNE. Uh, headed by Professor Del Fressi. So we um, have a specific um, uh, mission from the French government in um, uh, April, last uh, um, April, to to draw to to write um, an opinion about generative AI system and the ethical issues. So we were a group of people working on that um, with the leader who was um, Raja Shatila, uh, I, and Alexei Greenbaum, which is a philosopher. Um, so generative AI system raised many questions, including ethical, epistemological, anthropological, psychological, economic, social, political, and cultural ones. And some of these issues will continue to emerge as these technologies are put to new uses. So it's not yet possible to predict all the effects these technologies will have on individuals and society. And also um, more than that, on our democracy. So we previously also um, work on another opinion, which was also um, a mission from French government about conversational agents with um, I, I, I was leader with uh, Alexei Rainbow, and we work on a different aspect of these machines with about the status confusion, trust in chatbot, the manipulation and nudge in, um, with chatbot, which is my uh, topic of research currently in uh, human machine interaction with robot or um, you know agents like Google. Um, also, we work on the chatbot emotion, my group of research. And uh, the other point we explained in this um, um, report was about the vulnerability in front of this machine. Um, this application like the memory of the dead and surveillance by chatbots and the language long-term effect. So there's a many topic which are very essential to discuss about ethical issues. So for the first thing, I would like to uh, explain more, but I'm, I'm sure that you know a lot of you are experts on the financial model, but I would like to just to, to ex, um, precise or demystify some um, hyper parameters used in this, uh, when you build, you, when you build such a system. So generative AI systems are based on financial models. So financial models is a term introduced by Stanford University um, this model is a large-scale model based on the um, deep learning network architecture trained 
on a um, large quantity of annotated data and generally by self-supervised learning, but also with a, um, data collection, which are a huge effect on the, the quality of uh, the model. So these foundation models open us new perspectives and introduce a new paradigm in language processing, but also in the processing of multimodal science. And when we spoke about large language models, is a specific case for models from coming from text. So there's an, this acceleration of uh, this kind of model from January 21, uh, where we test the Lambda in uh, um, research. GPT-2 was say that dangerous from uh, OpenAI, but um, currently the, in 2022, uh, we have the chat GPT in the, uh, end of everybody in uh, society, in the community, uh, largely distributed. So um, it, it, it was um, um, strange to have this uh, dangerosity explained by this uh, uh, huge uh, giant of numeric, uh, these um, companies, and then later to push this uh, system uh, in the end of everybody without a lot of explanation. Another um, uh, project, you know, the Bloom project, uh, was quite interesting in Europe because it's the idea to have an open uh, science, uh, um, an open um, big model that we can play with in um, our community of research. So as I say, there is these three kind of uh, ML machine learning techniques, unsupervised, supervised, and reinforcement learning. And um, one thing that is very meaningful to understand is the fact that um, this transformer is trained um, on data set dividing tokens. Tokens, these um, minimal um, units, represent in the form of word, but even um, largely with subwords, four characters, for example. And the size of the vector representing each token is, for example, in GPT 3.5, um, 512 parameters. So transformers are based on the distributional hypothesis according to which words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings, um, which is uh, related to this um, publication from Fierce in 19. Um, 57. So it's quite interesting that um, we use this kind of uh, old uh, understanding of uh, uh, linguistic aspects. So the distributional hypothesis and the vector models used to reason tokens make it possible to calculate a distance between them, between the tokens. When this distance is small, the proximity of the vectors in the vector space correspond to a certain king shape. So token vectors found in similar contexts in a training data set tend to become close to each other. In this way, the transformer learns the coefficient of the lexical fold vectors from information about the appearance of tokens in different contexts. So any association of words in a training corpus will be interpreted as semantic proximity during vectorization. How we can find the vector size that achieves the best compromise between achieving the desired level of semantic nuance and increasing computation in time. In addition, transformer implements a calculation mechanism called the attention mechanism, which adjusts the weight of each token according to all the others. So transformers thus learns the more salient regularities between tokens without being influenced by their order, without any information from semantic levels and concept of semantics as human do. And there are two main families of transformers, the GPT type models from OpenAI, used by OpenAI, and BERT type models using both by Google. GPT generally pre-trained transformer models are trained to predict the next token in the sequence. And then BERT is bidirectional encoder, representation from transformer models, and trying to predict what comes before and after the token. So I use for my research, for example, the 
parts, the encoding part of transformer for trying to um, better uh, predict sentiment analysis from text, but also from audio, emotion analysis from audio. What are these hyperparameters? Hyperparameters of the foundational models are decisive for the structure of the model, the number of layers in the neural network, the dimension of the token vectors, the size of the token dictionary, and so on. And for the training model also, as you know, learning coefficient number of epochs and so on. For chatbot using foundational models, the size of its history is decisive for the model performance. And as you see, um, for GPT 3.5, it's eight, thousand tokens for open eyes more and entropy close more and more so these hyperparameters are often not disclosed for reason of security of confidentiality that's really important another key parameter is the temperature which based on the degree of randomness in the choice of tokens at a high temperature the model is more creative because it can generate more diverse outputs Whereas at a low temperature, the model tends to choose the most likely outputs, making the generated text more predictable. So parameter tuning is important in the design of a model and can have a significant impact on its performance. So that's why we, we want to have this more transparent, uh, transparency about how these systems are built. And lot of research are needed on this topic. Since the end of uh, 2022, economic and political actors in several countries are discussing the impact of language models built with this uh, generative AI system. Some of these models have an impressive number of parameters. For example, this uh, 175 billion parameters from GPT-3.5, but there is a race. The race for the largest models is uh, ongoing with GPT-4, with the Bai Wudu Chinese model. So th there's a real question. Is it necessary to have all this um, depends of energy? It's not certain that even larger models will deliver higher performance. That is the case for all the, what we want to do. And Google has also published Palm 2, which fewer parameters than in predecessor Palm. And maybe smaller models could be the future and will perform more on specially well on specialized tasks. So another topic which is really relevant is to know how many um, synthetic data are used in the, for building this kind of system. So to overcome data bias or lack of data, we use synthetic data. And um, it's necessary to monitor and reduce the proportion of synthetic content in the training data sets. The easy solution has been little evaluated and could have negative consequences on the behavior of the system. This effect requires future further research. Similarly, the reuse of LLM productions as training data or the simulation of our artificial user in RLHF must be studied in and evaluated transparently. So um, what happens also when one tries to incorporate social values and filter into generative AI system? LLMs can produce potentially dangerous output, which can take many forms, including harmful content, such as hate speech, incitement to, or glorification of violence or pornographic content. In a quest of neutrality, general AI systems are optimized with filter built by the designer. In addition, in RLHF, the annotator receives intuition to gain his choice. So the social values reflect in the filters, such as bias prevention, are therefore linked to the human being testing the system and to the designer's choice. Today, this process is neither transparent nor verified. And the method no adversarial evaluation by human teams, node and red teaming, has been extended beyond its original domain in cybersecurity and applied to LLMs. It refers to the use of many types of surveys, tests, and attack on AI systems, for example, by prompt injection, in order to uncover bias or emergent behavior in these models. So another point is the language used uh, in the LLM. 
Since 2020, generative AI models have often been multilingual. They have been built by, from data sets in several languages, most often with English or Chinese as a dominant language. In fact, the training data set available is uh, uh, largely from English uh, speaking. So the generation of text in certain languages where there are a few data sets can be made more efficient thanks to this multilingual system. And also there is a critical thing about ethical um, um, consequence. So if I just say, say some words about ethical issues, um, there's two levels. So first is, um, in parallel with the Enlightenment paradigm, you know, the anthropological analysis of technology since the 19th century shows the tendency to make sense of these transformations, at least initially in terms of binary opposition between revolution and catastrophe or between salvation and apocalypse, which is a huge question. We have to take care about the um, pragmatic of the discourse from all the big companies, but also experts uh, on media. So the current ambition of companies such as OpenAI or Google to create a general artificial intelligence that would be comparable to or even superior uh, human intelligence is part of this. By propagating this kind of discourse, ChatGPT designers are simultaneously feeding fears and hopes, avoiding the contract issues at stake in favor or an un not in a, but still fascinating horizon. So this polarized discourse also serves to give them a strong position in international political debates on the regulation of generative AI. So there is this race um, to for ever more powerful system. And this vision uh, fiction of creating a general artificial intelligence um, is, is a really huge um, ethical subject. Open access publication of generative AI model will soon become the industry standard. Um, however, some manufacturers are opposed to the opening up of these models, pointing to their possible misuse, such as the generation of misinformation. There was this AI moratorium from um, Benjo and a lot of researcher that we, uh, this is complex because all this, uh, this course was very strange. Um, for some of them, there is this idea of um, profit, like for Elon Musk, which is now um, <clears throat> doing the same thing that he criticized and won this. He was the first to explain, or maybe it was only the journalist that put him in the first uh, place, but there is complicated uh, um, approach in uh, society about that. And Jan Lequin revealed that uh, uh, AI model choose, um, it, it is not close to human intelligence, um, this uh, AI generative models. And he proposed something else, JPE, join, embedding predictive architecture, which is quite interesting because of the fact that uh, the system can learn by observing the world around it through self-learning using emotion detection and emotion modelization, which is uh, also very ethical, uh, with a lot of ethical um, questions. So uh, we write this um, recommendation in this um, um, document for the government, uh, which in mind a uh, different objective. And um, I, I don't want to um, um, read all these recommendations, but I will let you my slides to, uh, uh, to the audience to, to be able to uh, critical, to be critic about this recommendation or to, we can exchange later about that. Um, there are several levels. Uh, I just will uh, write the title, um, read the title. Sorry for my voice. And it's, it's a huge effort to speak. Um, Ethics in the design and research of generative AI system, which first recommendation, the designers of a generative AI system 
must analyze during the design phase each of the technological choices likely to give rise to ethical tensions. If a potential tension is identified, they must methodologically consider a technical solution based on research aimed at reducing or eliminating the ethical tension and then evaluate the solution in realistic context of use. So we would like also to enlighten the fact that we, we must prevent designers from over-policing models also. And then for governance, we have also decided to create a sovereign research and training entity for AI science and society. So given the complexity of this, the issues involved in generative AI and its medium and long-term impact, it's necessary to create a sovereign entity, a center of competence, European one, dedicated to research and training on the ethical issues of AI system in relation to their scientific, technical, societal, and environmental impacts. So it's urgent because um, there is a more and more um, um, acceleration of this technology, the usage of this technology. So also we like to um, unlike the fact that choosing the right data corpus is a real complex um, subject. And then um, um, and then uh, I, I'm sure that you know this uh, this corpus, the corpora. We have to take care about the relation to truth and lack of uh, meaning. So hallucination from LLM, which is uh, an example. And also um, verify the quality of source for training, take into account the effect of the choice made for model hyperparameters like I'll I explained before. And also the problem of manipulation of the user without responsibility. It's a huge topic. The machine may be perceived as more efficient or superior to human beings. For example, generative AI system based themselves on a good level of language. This creates a risk of manipulation of the user who may feel impaired or incompetent in the face of the machine's capabilities. So <clears throat> we, uh, an important recommendation is the fact that we must share practices in the use of generative AI system. Um, and in our opinion, it's necessary to build an ecosystem able to identify good and bad practices in the use of generative AI system in different types of application by vertical, for example, by type of um, application. In particular, it's necessary to create a pooling platform and a monitoring agency so the results must be made available to all members of the generative AI community. Uh, maintaining distinction is important between um, machine um, production and human production, maybe a bio label. Um, this, uh, the first thing is the, the introduction of watermark codes, uh, which are invisible codes, which are able, we, we are able to to introduce this kind of codes in uh, even in text because this uh, semantic uh, plungement. But there is a, this critic about uh, cybersecurity and um, it's not so easy to, to use that. Um, but it's important to maintain distinction and to know which kind of uh, um, who are the responsibility to uh, produce the text. So maintaining sanction, regulation of watermarks, um, for example, the obligation by to insert watermarks uh, should be introduced at regular uh, level. Projection, um, there are three types of uh, transfer between human beings and LLMs. The first involves the projection of knowledge after being trained in language model appears to know a lot of things. The knowledge of an LLM is merely an illusion, but the user believes that the machine really possesses it. The second type of transfer is that the emotional states and effects. Through the content generated, the machine can induce in the user an impression that is possess emotions or state of mind, even through the user knows that is it just a computer program. And the third type of transfer is that of mobile qualities, whether a generative AI system is perceived as 
benevolent, caring, or lecturing, these perceptions only exist through projections. So the LLM never becomes a moral agent or a person in the legal sense of the term. However, projection of moral qualities can go so far as to attribute responsibility to a machine, which by its very nature cannot assume any liability. So how to reduce this projection of human qualities onto generative AI system is a huge topic. And the emergence ability, emergent behavior, which is not a term that I like too much, um, in large scale language refer to the way in which these models produce unexpected or surprising results for their users, but also for their designers when faced with ambiguous or complex requests. And by definition, an LLM ability is called emergent if it is not present in smaller models, but occurs in larger models. Emergent abilities only occurs in very large models. Transformer-based LLMs exhibit several types of emergent behavior, such as rezoning cap capabilities, thanks to reason by step by step request. And the precise scientific explanation of the emergence phenomenon elements is the subject of current research and surely depends on the parameters of the model. It's certain that this behavior is linked to phenomena described by statistical physics. Thus, these emergent behaviors result from a complex interaction between the layers and parameters of the models. They are themselves a result of the training on huge data sets as the model learns the relationship or structures inherent in the training. So, we, another recommendation for research is that to investigate emergent behaviors and the unknown effect of these models. So the problem of multilinguism, I expect um, I explained before, um, this influence could be very huge because uh, it's our language. So it, there is a opinion, political uh, uh, opinion or pre private things into the language, so the production of uh, artificial language is a huge question. So we we want, we would like to push the, the community to develop um, or the company to develop generative AI system in different languages reflecting cultural diversity, but also to, to make more research on this influence of a dominant language on the generators of text in other, another language. And um, there is not a lot of um, work on this aspect, but some of them but, um, could be emphasis. And education is also um, really important. Generative AI systems are form an immediate application in education. The ability to produce scientifically correct and semantically plausible text in natural language gets them a unique tool. They can be used by students to write text, to answer homework questions by a teacher, to produce summaries or descriptions of the teaching, or to general um, uh, QC, MCQ. But human learning is a process. And the problem is the fact that uh, uh, the understanding of concepts, the assimilation of knowledge, and the acquisition of know-how are all achieved through reflection, reformulation, analysis, and synthesis. And this process used through which is based on language. So while education is about shaping people's minds and showing right. them how to reason closely, there is an obvious risk of replacing this objective with that of acquiring knowledge, the accuracy of which is not guaranteed via the machine. So as you see, there's many, many uh, recommendations in uh, this uh, um, document. I will uh, share with you all um, our uh, thinking about and also the fact that uh, AI Act now is uh, working on specific rules for this foundation model is a huge topic. So thank you for your attention and I will uh, ask questions if you have. Thank you very much, Laurence, for this uh, really enlightening and uh, multidimensional talk. I mean, you touched upon, <laughs> I, I, I cannot imagine, I didn't count how many dimensions. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Questions? Thank okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm wondering these, these watermarks, how should we imagine them 
concretely? I mean, if it's text, how? Yeah, yeah. for text, uh, it could be in the the vector, uh, the plongement vector. Is it possible to have some uh, specific uh, code? Or you can imagine other kind of uh, encoding due to the statical uh, um, um, presence of uh, regularity of a letter or things like that. We, we can put some um, this um, uh, watermark at di different levels, as I mentioned, directly in the text, okay? Which is not um, obvious, but could be done by algorithm, and or completely uh, in the semantic plungement in the token uh, I mentioned previously, vector representing each token. Do you understand what I say? Yes. Yes. So th there are several possibilities for text, and there is a lot of research on that. Also, I have not um, put all the Papers, but uh, if you're interested, we can discuss more. Other yes. questions? Uh, thank you, Laurence, for this uh, very enlightening talk. I have a related question is uh, because uh, the future of these uh, ch chatbots is to be integrated into every aspect of our lives. Uh, so when, whenever we'll be writing something, um, we'll have suggestions, right? Uh, whenever we'll be um, searching for something, we'll be using uh, a chatbot or, ch or la large language model, and we won't be even aware of that. So how can we regulate that um, if we don't know? I mean, for the time being, I know when I go to OpenAI ch ChatGPT that I am using ChatGPT. But in the future, I won't even know that. Yeah, it, it's a huge point. And also the fact that um, massively, People will use we will use that kind of tools. Okay, so um, I have not simplest uh, rule for that too. Um, I imagine that um, it's impossible to, impossible to uh, to modify the, the way of the history now, but we can educate people to use that kind of text. And also maybe we need to have biomarkers inside text because the, the, the complexity of that is uh, more and more the system will uh, produce uh, artificial uh, content with uh, um, this uh, not um, assurance uh, about truth because there is no verification at all and loss of uh, the sources. Um, if we have this um, more and more text uh, produced like that, we will train the future model with this kind of text, which is the uh, beginning of the end, you know, <laughs> because we will uh, have uh, more and more um, fake news and uh, misinformation and uh, deeply uh, uh, um, production like that everywhere, as you mentioned, and with uh, invisible uh, consequences. So it's our um, topic also as researchers to, to try to um, convince a political uh, governance uh, in the Euro European Union, but everywhere so in the world uh, about this uh, huge um, problem. And I, I, every, I know that uh, OECD, or a lot of um, ONU and so on are, are talking about that aspect so I'm not to I, I, I just want to say that we can as a community of uh, scientists produce more and more information about that more and more measure more and more um, 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 clear view vitrine of this and uh, we have to do that so I have no solution but I can uh, explain that um, we we can be involved in the process to be to help people to educate people to um, oh yeah. this is a huge loop you know Laurence, talking about regulation at the political level and sometimes I mean there is criticism about the risk of over-regulation do you see any risks 
with this regulation or overregulation at the European Union level or uh, I mean in the US there is there are similar discussions yeah there is similar discussion for um, uh, misinformation okay fake news this is this topic fake news and also uh, the ecological points will be maybe the two opportunity for us um, and to, to have a, a conscience of this danger, okay? I hope that uh, this will be sufficiently uh, huge uh, danger, uh, this misinformation, fake news in uh, this uh, area of where, everywhere, and uh, this political aspect, governance, um, for having uh, answer from our government. And uh, um, I'm optimistic about that, but maybe I'm wrong. There are several um, drawbacks to uh, have these rules. Yeah, sure. But I, as I mentioned here, yeah, I, I return to my previous uh, slide from Bloomberg, um, um, papers in you know, a date from yesterday or uh, 16 or 17. Um, they say planes from the European Parliament and Council drew criticism that the government could hinder smaller companies' ability to compare to major tech giants. There's a lot of uh, draw, drawback yeah, to, to have uh, roles, but how we can prevent uh, the vulnerability of our children? That's my main topic. I would like to ask you, that a few years ago, there was a boom in um, visual image recognition or with um, convolutional neuro neural networks. And there was a particular architecture that was generative adversarial networks yeah. that were generating very realistic images and video. And nonetheless, it didn't generate as much discussion as language models generate nowadays. So I'm wondering, what do you think is the difference in the context? Because those were obviously images. Now we have text and yeah. language and why does it generate as so much more discussion than those images were generating yeah but it's due to the popularity of uh, this uh, chat gpt you know it's clear uh, with a gun we have uh, also the this property to produce very similar and interesting uh, video audio um Audio, it, it was more complex, but for image, as you mentioned, it, it was very helpful. And uh, there is uh, no conscience from the massive uh, um, citizens that these uh, tools are existing, you know. Since the release of uh, this uh, OpenAI ChatGPT last year, these tools, generative AI, have exploded in popularity. It's exactly the beginning of this um, article. This is now a real thing because it's massively used. Gan was uh, not known by the every people in the in society and maybe not very used. Used in many, mostly for research or not visible. Okay. This is explanation. Thank you very much, Laurence. We will have to close okay. the session. Time is okay. start, so, started pressing. We're grateful to you for uh, all the effort you've made, uh, despite all, all the issues, <laughs> voice, etc. Yeah. And uh, see you soon. Thanks a lot. See you soon. Thanks a lot. Bye.